All right, now on to the second part of my lecture on the relationship between theory and observation in the sciences. So here's where we left off last time. Sometimes different scientists, different labs will have competing data or competing interpretations of data. Uh, and there might be several reasons for the differences. Uh, it could be different expectations from the experimenters, or it might be different theoretical commitments. So, you know, usually these disagreements are brought to conclusion upon closer inspection. Today we're going to look at a particular example of a major disagreement that happened between two groups of scientists over a very important scientific issue. So now it is story time. Gather around, kids. This is a story about the interpretation of satellite data with respect to climate change. So, some background. Um, we've got several sources of climate data, and we're going to focus on two in this story. Uh, we've had data from weather stations that goes back to the late 19th century. Um, uh, climate scientists, however, have only been using satellite data since the 1960s, which is a shorter amount of time, obviously, than um, on a scientific scale, it's a fairly short amount of time. Nonetheless, you know, you can glean a lot from satellite data. Uh, so, a little bit more information on weather satellites. Since 1978, satellites carrying what are called microwave sounding units, MSUs, have measured how much microwave radiation is produced by oxygen molecules in the atmosphere. Uh, there is an exploitable relationship between the microwave radiation produced by oxygen and the temperature of the broad layers of the atmosphere. For those of you who have studied some basic physics and know a little bit about electromagnetic radiation, microwave radiation is fairly long wave, uh, comparable to like infrared radiation. Um, you know, shorter wave radiation tends to be more intense, uh, like UV, X ray, and so on. But, anyways, you can go to the Wikipedia page for electromagnetism, it's probably, for a Wikipedia page, it's probably fairly accurate. I don't need to explain that. Um, so satellite data is primarily concerned with the temperature distribution of the troposphere and the lower stratosphere. So the troposphere is, you know, the air you're breathing right now, and the stratosphere is what's above that. And you can see the range, troposphere goes up to 10 kilometers, although that varies with height depending on where you are, how far you are from the equator, uh, at the temperature and so on, and the stratosphere goes on a bit higher. Uh, this is generally where airplanes fly, commercial airliners, and then in the mesosphere, you know, you're not going to be able to breathe much up there. Um, satellites can also record surface temperatures of land and sea from infrared data in cloud-free conditions. The key is it's got to be cloud-free conditions. So, controversies surrounding satellite data they illustrate the fact that sometimes the most reliable raw data isn't actually the data that seems, from a naive point of view, to be the most directly tied to the phenomenon of interest. And what this means will become obvious as we continue in this story. So, the satellite data controversy concerned data about the distribution of temperatures from 1978 to 2000 specifically around what measurements revealed about the temperature record of the tropical troposphere. So it's a certain part of the troposphere uh, over the tropics. Um, so the troposphere, as I already mentioned, is the lowest layer of Earth's atmosphere. And the, trop in the troposphere in the tropics is about 20 kilometers deep. Okay? Like I said, the size of the troposphere varies with how far you are from the equator, with the temperature obviously around the poles. In the Arctic area, it's much shallower. Uh, so, in spite of the fact that the troposphere extends to the surface of the Earth, the Earth's surface temperature we consider to be a distinct measurable quantity from the temperature of the troposphere. Uh, it's uh, as an aside. So this was the controversy. There was an apparent clash between the measured surface temperature in the tropics and that of the tropical troposphere. Uh, again, there was a tension between the measured surface temperature in the tropics and in the temperature of the tropical troposphere. The tropospheric data was primarily estimated from satellites, unlike the surface temperature. Um, so global climate models had predicted heat, that heat trapping gases in the atmosphere would cause the tropical surface temperatures and the tropical troposphere temperatures to rise. So they predicted that surface temperatures and I guess the troposphere, I don't, the, the layer of the atmosphere called the troposphere, the air temperature would rise. 
due to heat trapping gases, greenhouse gases, basically, you know, carbon dioxide, methane, uh, water vapor. They predicted that tropospheric temperatures would rise slightly faster than surface temperatures. So these are what models, computational models, dynamical computational models, running simulations predicted. Um, however, according to one prominent group's model of the satellite data, a group from the University of Alabama at Huntsville, I'll, which I'll abbreviate as UAH, this group, uh, led by John Christie and Roy Spencer, according to them, the troposphere was not warming at all. Why would they think that? Well, furthermore, estimates show that the troposphere might actually be cooling. So climate change predicts that troposphere will be warming due to heat trapping gases. And then these two scientists say, ah, actually, we got evidence that it's cooling. They also, so they concluded, Christine Spencer, they concluded that the climate models are unreliable. We're making predictions about future climate based on these computational models and these um, are predicting that the troposphere will warm. We've got evidence that the troposphere is actually cooling. Therefore, the climate models are not reliable. In which case, we probably shouldn't trust them. We shouldn't make policy decisions based on them, according to Christie and Spencer. You know, what's an unreliable model? You know, here's a model who's supposed to wear the latest and dad's watching the kids play soccer attire. That's not reliable. Here's a reliable model modeling the latest dad's watching kids play soccer attire. That's not what I mean. Okay, well, here's what we mean by a reliable model. It's an accurate depiction of the, what the model is of. So if a, it's a climate model, it'll accurately depict the climate and it's, it makes true predictions, okay? So if a model makes predictions that turn out false, but doesn't accurately represent the right parts of what it's supposed to represent, we would say it's not a reliable model. Well, there are two options when we come across, um, we have two options when a model when a model's predictions fail to match the data, the observed data. So the model makes a prediction and then the data does not match with the predictions. You either reject the model or you reject the data. All right. Well, for many climate scientists, the second option, rejecting the data, is not an idle worry. It's a serious concern. Um, for one thing, the temperature records of the troposphere taken from satellites, they're really complicated. It's um, very complicated to reconstruct them. Um, the satellites with the onboard microwave sounding units orbit the Earth at 35,000 kilometers per hour. I forgot to add the per hour there, but that's, they're very fast. Um, the microwave sounding units, they measure the microwave radiation emitted by oxygen molecules in the atmosphere. Uh, the radiation bears a very complex relationship to the air temperature. Um, and the microwave radiation is found in a variety of different channels each also bearing a complicated relationship to the altitude where the oxygen molecules are found. Um, so the reconstruction then of the temperature from the radiance, it depends on many details of the methods used to do the calculation and on many auxiliary assumptions such as the degree of center decay and the amount the satellite had drifted in its initial orbit, orbital drift, um, which all things orbiting the Earth drift. So getting a useful model of the data out of these satellites requires complex modeling that sorts out all of the complicated relationships between the satellite orbits, the decays of the orbits, the connection between the temperature and radiance from various channels at various orbital positions, and the relationship between altitude and the contribution of the radiance found in the various channels. So the, United, um, the University of Alabama at Huntsville's model represented one attempt to tease out the influences, and they produced a simple graph of tropospheric temperature over time, and that model showed no warming. So is Earth not warming after all? Is the prediction that greenhouse gases, heat-trapping gases, are going to cause the troposphere to warm? Are they just false? You know, should we waste our, you know, all this talk now? Is it idle? Um, well, defenders of these climate models that predicted the warming took a different route. They rejected the data and they criticized the University of Alabama at Huntsville's data set. Uh, so two rival groups making data models for the satellite emerged. One was the Remote Sensing Systems Group and the other one was a group from the University of Maryland. Uh, so they both 
both RSS and the University of Maryland produced temperature data that showed more warming than the Alabama data set. Um, the sets were also more compatible with the simulation models, and they showed greater agreement with the weather station surface data. Um, but the University of Alabama at Huntsville group had an ace up their sleeve that posed a very significant challenge to RSS in, in the University of Maryland. They had weather balloon data, radio sons. Um, so radio sound data, weather balloon, according to the UHH group, independently confirms their satellite data set. It independently confirmed that there is no warming in the tropical troposphere. What? That's crazy. Uh, actually, it's not. Well, let's see. why do they think that? Um, so according to the Alabama group, the uh, radio sound data, the weather balloon data, was especially reliable because it measures the temperature directly. They have actual thermometers on the balloons, so it takes a direct measurement of the temperature rather than going through that very complicated process that satellites with microwave sounding units have to rely on to calculate the temperature. Okay, I mean, it's, you saw how complicated that was, whereas these weather balloons just do it directly. So surely that's far more reliable, right? It's a direct... Um, so, RSS in the University of Maryland produced temperature data from satellites consistent with climate models but the University of Alabama at Huntsville produced temperature data from satellites consistent with measurements from the weather balloon thermometers themselves, which directly measure the temperature of the atmosphere. Uh, seems like that's better, right? Well, there's some problems with Alabama's claims. Um, and let's look at them in turn. First, Weather balloons, radio signs, are actually unreliable for long-term temperature trends. They're designed for weather forecasting, but they're not meant to produce data that is intercomparable across large intervals of time and space, basically like climate data is. So they're good for weather forecasting, not so much for climate data. Um, for one thing, there's been many f changes, frequent changes and improvements in the way that weather balloons function. So it's Comparing them across time is its kind of an apples and oranges story. Uh, it's not directly comp comparable. Um, they also are impacted by things like solar heating and time of day, okay, which is going to impact their temperature measurements. Uh, another and far more worrisome issue is that weather balloons are irregularly spaced. So it's hard to get meaningful spatial averages. Um, there's way fewer weather balloons over the ocean than over land, for one thing. And they haven't been consistently spaced. It's just hard to make these calculations. Uh, scientists then using these weather balloon data, this radio sun data, um, they have been able to make different assumptions about their spatial distribution, but these produce radically different data sets, including sets with temperature trends in the opposite direction. So they, they get inconsistent data from weather balloons. So the weather balloon data is just kind of not reliable. Um, there are also problems with the claim that the weather balloon data provides independent confirmation of the Alabama satellite data. The Alabama group actually used weather balloon data, radio sound data, to choose between different methods of satellite intercalibration. So the balloon data didn't actually provide independent confirmation as the data set, the satellite data set, was calibrated with the assumption that the weather balloon data was accurate. So the weather balloon data was used to calibrate the data set, the satellite data. Okay, So that's not independent confirmation at all. The one thing was dependent on the other. Um, so a massive collaboration of experts in climate modeling, statistical analysis, uh, got together. They collected data from a variety of sources. This was a team led by Ben Saunter, and they led to a resolution. Um, it was a very complex affair. I'm not going to deny that. I'm giving you the highlights of this story, and you can already see that this highlights, this outline is very complicated. Uh, but the experts used other independent data sets, such as sea surface temperature, water vapor measurements, tropopause heights. Um, these all bear systemic relationships to tropospheric temperatures to produce independent estimates of the data. What did they find? Well, they these data sets right here, from sea, water, sea surface, water vapor, and tropopause heights. Uh, by the way, tropopause gets taller the hotter it gets. Basic Boyle's gas laws explains that. Um, you know, 
temperature causes an increase in volume or pressure. But again, um, so these data sets all supported the RSS data set, and they are also consistent with warming trends predicted by the models. And these data sets actually made more sense in light of the more trustworthy land surface temperatures. So eventually RSS um, also identified errors with the way that Alabama accounted for the degree of satellite orbital drift. So the controversy was settled in favor of RSS in Maryland and the com simulation models. And the Alabama, uh, one of the Alabama authors, John Christie, agreed and actually co-authored a report for the U.S. Climate Change Science Program in 2006. And this is what Christie said. Previously reported discrepancies between the amount of warming near the surface and higher in the atmosphere have been used to challenge the reliability of climate models and the reality of human-induced global warming. The significant discrepancy no longer exists because errors in the satellite and radio sound data have been identified and have been corrected. The new data sets have also been developed that do now show such discrepancies. Here's the moral of the story. In the satellite data controversy, the less theoretically tainted data, the weather balloon data with thermometers that took direct temperature measurements, actually turned out to be less reliable than other data sources. If you want to learn more about this, uh, the sources I relied on were this, this article by Elizabeth Oyd, Lloyd, a professor at the University of Indiana, or at Indiana University, called on the role of complex empiricism in debates about the satellite data and climate models, and then the book Philosophy and Climate Science by, the, uh, by Eric Winsberg. So back to the theory observation distinction then. Um, scientists make progress not just by collecting observations, but they also learn how we observe. They observe observation, you could say. And that's how they improve scientific methods. Um, they learn where they went wrong and how experimental design can be improved, for example. It's entirely reasonable then to hold that we have greatly improved our methods for gathering reliable data and are continuing to do so. We have gone by leaps and bounds. Uh, so criticism is justified in particular instances, but you shouldn't criticize all of science. Okay, You can criticize a particular episode, but not all of science. You shouldn't be skeptical to all of science, or even entire branches of science for that matter. It's generally not justified. We need to give very specific details about very specific cases. Um, history, in fact, doesn't provide that much support that experiences and observation reports are contaminated by theoretical commitments. Um, or in so far that the theoretical commitments make the observation reports unreliable. Um, I mean, we just looked at one, but you know, we resolved that issue. Um, so even though expectations can influence observations, Better experimental design can minimize this, and science generally progresses. They do improve their techniques. They refine it, and they get better. Uh, so we, there are three lessons in that we can take away from this. First, experiences are subject to systemic errors. We're not passive experiencers. We do have biases, and they're not always overcome by just looking harder or closer. Think again about the Mueller-Leon illusion. You can't help but see those two lines of being an unequal length, even though we know they're the same length. Uh, nonetheless, too, a second lesson is that when you do recognize deficiencies in your data gathering, this isn't a cause for alarm. It's an opportunity for progress, and scientists usually take advantage of this. They do improve when they find a deficiency. Uh, we might look at the replication crisis in medical and social sciences later this semester, and this is an example where they found a deficiency, and they're taking measures to fix it. Um, a third lesson is it's important to understand why some studies are inadequate. Uh, however, it takes sometimes a lot of scientific training to really appreciate the reasons, as we just saw on the satellite data controversy. Um, so scientific communities might reject data for good reasons that the public isn't in a position to understand, even when skeptics cry that the scientists are being dogmatic or unfair. Think about um, with the coronavirus epidemic, uh, certain types of treatments that have been um, promoted uh, but haven't enjoyed main, widespread acceptance in the scientific community. Even though the public, the lay people, are, you know, think these are treatments that you know, are really promising. Um, just think about this. Like The public has not had the training that scientists have. Why are the scientists not convinced? Um, and there's lots of examples of this. So yeah. Um, I think another, you know, the placebo effect uh, something to consider. 
So the placebo effect you're familiar with, it reveals that our personal experience with a drug aren't itself a reliable guide to its efficacy. We might have a strong conviction, conviction that the drug worked, even though there's, no, there's overwhelming evidence that it did not work. Uh, that's why in clinical trials, they give a placebo to one group and then an actual drug to the other. But neither group knows what they've taken. Um, it's one way they can determine how effective a drug actually is. Um, so again, that's why trials use placebos to determine a drug's efficacy. And if a drug doesn't work any better than the placebo, then that's a reason to suspect that the drug is not going to be effective. Um, so what can we learn from this? Uh, again, the issue is not all of science, but think about you know, but particular scientific results, methods, and studies. We want reliable methods. Scientists do too, and they're constantly tweaking and revising their methods. That's scientific progress. That's how science progresses. The end.